Well, we are so thrilled to be here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we are Goody Clancy. We are a Boston-based firm of 60 people. And when we started this process, we were just so enamored by the craft and the hands-on nature that is embedded in terracotta. And we got our chance to go to Boston Valley's facility and learn even more about how they do uh, the magic that they do. This is our team here. So we had the luxury to partner with SGH. They were our structural engineers on the project. And then today you'll be hearing from myself, uh, Daniel Chen and Rachel from our team. So Goody Clancy, we focus on higher education. We are higher ed experts. We do work uh, all over the United States for different college campuses. And so we really wanted to take a look at how we could do a masonry facade differently. So how do you uh, create a rain screen with terracotta and take advantage of all the benefits of that system. So, you know, we were trying to create a facade that dialogues with the past while looking toward the future. Um, some of the benefits that the terracotta system has is it's very lightweight. It's very easily sculptured and figural as you've seen from some of the examples today. Uh, something that transforms from a plane to an object. And then we really wanted to focus on something that's cost effective. So terracotta is always in the mix when we're looking at different projects and it seems to get value engineered a lot. And so how do we get as much value out of our module and our pieces as possible? We wanted something that was very thermally capable. So not just looking at the facade itself, but we looked at the overall wall assembly that we'll show you in this presentation. And then sustainability is embedded in our practice uh, every day. And so, you know, we really looked at how do we create a decreased global warming potential for this facade? As we all know, design is not uh, necessarily as streamlined as this graph here. It was very iterative. We were constantly learning, constantly getting new inputs and trying to understand as much as we can from the system. We did have kind of three buckets that we looked at. So that's form, uh, looking at how contextual it can be to dialogue with this historic campus, something that is very uh, value, valuable and getting as much value as we can out of the module. So we really limited ourselves to four modules and trying to get as much bang for our buck. And then analytics, we use a lot of different uh, analytical tools to help us evaluate these inputs and figure out our final results. So we were a team of five. And when we looked at what terracotta could do, you know, we started looking at historic precedents. We started looking at tiles that are shingled or vertical extrusions um, that are creating a very different effect and trying to learn as much as we can about the different manufacturing processes. I think that's one of the really unique things about ACOL. We wanted to learn the rules so that way we could take it and implement it on these different projects. And so for, for all five of us, we each took a different scheme. You know, if some one person was looking at what does it look like if it's slip cast? What does it look like if it's ramp pressed? How do you try and create a, a chain mail screen that's really permeable? Um, and we constantly had a, a dialogue and a democratic kind of voting system. So we used this matrix to look at how do we evaluate the different value form and analytics for the different schemes. Very quickly, we landed at kind of a, a RAM press module as being the sweet spot with some of these inputs. And so we liked the, the proportions that the RAM press could give us. We liked the fact that you get a lot of value out of one module. And then the challenge was how to create a pattern that's very repetitive, very unique, and something that's homogeneous across the facade. So you're not necessarily seeing the panel joints and understanding each of the pieces. We really loved this kind of alternating running bond pattern and some of the some of the ledges that were created, the peaks and valleys, and then how the glaze would incorporate into that. So we really were thinking about the glaze very early on in the process of how it works with the design. So our final module that we'll share with you today um, throughout the process was kind of taking advantage of this RAM press. So we maximized that out at 24 by 30. We sliced the face of a standard module so that way the glaze would kind of pool and run as these get fired in the horizontal position. We rotated, we went with a running bond pattern. So it's uh, kind of creating this more homogeneous effect. And then we introduced these false joints that kind of come halfway into the panels. And what that does is kind of hide the seams. And then we have what we call our zipper joint kind of in between each panels. And so you'll see that uh, moving forward in the presentation.
also, as David highlighted earlier, um, some of our design criteria were more on the analytical side of the spectrum. And given that sustainability is an integral part of our practice at Giddy Clancy, um, ACAW was no different um, in this experience. And so the two primary sustainability metrics that we were really looking at were daylighting and um, carbon footprint. So here you're basically seeing our workflow and uh, going from 3D modeling, um, bringing that content into uh, um, simulation programs, uh, tally for carbon footprint calculations and honeybee and ladybug for daylight simulations. And then ultimately using Excel for data management to keep track of all of our experiments and to use that those results to refine our design iterations. So on the next slide, you'll see um, what we were primarily looking at for daylighting, which was solar daylight autonomy and annual sunlight exposure and trying to strike that balance between providing even uh, daylight penetration into a space while also mitigating the potential for glare. Um, we're really interested in using the terracotta itself as part of the shading system, um, instead of depending on a secondary material that might have a higher carbon footprint. So what you're seeing here is basically a comparison um, of our baseline, which is a typical uh, brick facade with punch openings without any shading system. Um, and then two other schemes that are kind of um, studied against each other, both informed by different manufacturing processes, the one in the middle being an extruded scheme and the one on the right uh, being a ram press scheme. Um, on the next slide, you'll kind of see the guts of the entire operation where we use Excel to keep track of um, all of our controls and our variables as we were iterating through this design process and keeping track of all of our records um, so we can always refer back to something that may have performed better or worse. Um, and kind of evaluating these systems. And we ultimately went with a RAM press um, system, mainly because the kind of natural evolution of the rain, of the sorry, sh shading system um, gave the most well-rounded results in terms of balancing solar daylight autonomy and um, mitigating flare. And so Rachel will kind of walk you through our carbon analysis with Tally. Thanks, Dan. So similar to how we looked at um, daylighting, throughout the design process, we were looking at carbon footprint uh, and to compare our different schemes. So we learned pretty early on that the two biggest factors that we can manipulate to decrease the overall carbon footprint were the volume of clay in the system and the amount of metal backup structure that was required to hold it up. So we discovered that the RAM press um, modules had the least amount of clay volume per square foot because you could hollow out the entire back against an uh, extruded scheme that would just be hollowed out at the core. And um, we discovered we could minimize the amount of backup structure by vertically orienting the modules so we could space those backup horizontal rails as far apart as possible. So on the next slide, you'll see our, uh, our scheme deployed and the strategies we used. Um, we had the vertically oriented ramp plus RAM press module, we maximize the size of the module to the maximum size for the RAM press. Um, and then at the backup structure, you can see the um, horizontal rails are uh, maximized spacing based on the vertical orientation. And then we further minimize the amount of metal required by um, using helping hands instead of for the vertical support instead of a, a Z clip. So that's essentially a continuous L that's held back with a, a intermittent clip. And then we looked at different ways we could use insulation, different than mineral wool, that um, would reduce the carbon footprint. And we ended up using a wood fiber insulation um, in our project. So beyond the, the analytics, Glaze was, as David mentioned before, early on one of our big design drivers. We really wanted to create a facade that had the, the color contrast and textural qualities of some more historic facade systems like brick and rusticated stone. So we, we looked at creating uh, contours in our module that we could then use to um, direct glaze in different directions and get a variation of color. So we looked at having these folded planes where uh, a more runny glaze could run into the, the corners and be darker and kind of break at the peak. And you would see the through body color coming through. So some of our, our early color inspiration came from those historic campuses we work on. We looked at, at granite, at brick, at copper. And then we, we noticed that in all these campuses, you seem to have this accent of green, whether that be oxidized copper or the um, vines that grow up a brick facade. 
So you'll see on the next slide some of the, the early design iterations or um, glaze iterations we got from Andy Graham. And we were blown away by just the, the color variation you could get from glaze alone. On the left, this kind of gold sparkling patina, and then that burgundy brick tone, and then even some explorations on using brick in our glaze itself. So we wanted to then test out how some of these glazes would work on our actual geometry. So Andy helped us create a, a mock-up of a portion of our final module. So you'll see we sent him a, a Rhino file and he created this flip test mode for us. And we were able to test out a couple iterations of our glaze. And you'll see on the, the next slide, on the left here are some of the explorations we had where we looked at different consistencies of the glaze. Um, so that to see if it needs to be more thick or more runny and the different metals we could employ in it that would give us different effects to give that kind of patina to our, our module. And you'll see some of the, the mock-up images on the right where we explored uh, what tonal qualities it has and um, this kind of patina effect. And here on our, our final module, you'll see those, those dark burgundy corners and kind of the coppery tones at the peaks and that patina of the, that um, sparkle. So fairly early on in the design process, we were inspired to introduce some kind of biophilic element um, into our design module. Um, so a lot of our early studies looked at different types of plants and different ways in which they grow and host themselves to different surfaces. And we really wanted the module that we developed to really interface with these properties of plants. And it was really important to us in the beginning to introduce this moment of biophilia in a space where it would be appreciated both by occupants within the building and uh, spectators outside the building. And what you'll see in the next slide is what was one of our kind of favorite early um, design explorations that was very much informed by our daylighting studies for filtering light. We found it could be a perfect opportunity for vines to grow and weave in and out and also kind of dapple light through its leaves. Um, so we looked at different uh, ways in which these apertures could be created um, and what the proportions might look like. Um, but you know, as as you all know, this is a great learning process um, throughout. And um, while we were designing the system, we found a, out more about the limitations and capabilities of terracotta, and we ended up having to pivot um, away from this strategy because of the impracticality of the system um, based on our standard module. There would be some problems and vulnerabilities in the manufacturing process, just getting the clay to the firing kiln um, that could lead to issues in constructability down the road in the field when it's being put up. Um, there are also concerns about the extra metal backup required to support this structurally, which would have blown things out of balance in terms of our other values and um, goals in terms of our, our carbon footprint. So we had to kind of pivot while still holding on to our values of um, achieving the same daylight uh, autonomy um, goals and creating a moment of biophilia that's appreciable for everyone um, around this building. So we looked at our standard module and found that an edge condition planter would be able to um, meet all of those goals um, that we had in mind. Um, so if you go into the next slide, you'll kind of see how our planter kind of organically grew out of our standard module, where we had our standard module at the window condition and we eroded its edge to create a space for which we could introduce a planter. Um, and it's supported at the window jam as highlighted and suggested in orange, which David will kind of walk you through when he talks about the mock-up. But um, keeping with the planter, the planter itself takes advantage of the depth of the rain screen assembly to maximize the soil um, capacity for the plants. And then the volumes themselves are also hollowed out for soil continuity and to allow water to percolate um, down and through these kind of cascading trapezoids. The form of the planter itself also echoes the kind of tessellation of our standard module so that it fits very well in the kind of uh, overall context of the facade. So on the next slide, you'll see um, all of our modules that we developed starting from the left going to the right. We have our planter module at the window that's adjacent to this kind of perforated eroded module uh, together. We have a kind of edge module that kind of completes the other jam side of the window opening. And then we have our standard module that makes up the field. Um, of this kind of prototypical uh, facade study. And so now David will walk you through uh, what we learned in the mock-up. Thanks, Dan. So one of the things that we really loved about this opportunity was getting to work with our hands and really understand the material. You know, so much of what architects do day-to-day -day is drawing. And so any opportunity we get to, to take this into the physical realm, we see so much value in that. 
So this is our final mock-up cart. It incorporated four modules, two typical modules, our perforated module that Dan mentioned for daylight, our planter module, and then kind of a window um, that you can imagine. So this would be at a sill and jam condition. And one thing that was unique about our panels to try and keep with that module value concept was that they could all be rotated 180 degrees. And what that did is it created different effects within the, the glaze and how that would work. And it also gave different opportunities for this purpose and what you're seeing through the facade. This is a quick uh, time lapse of, of the process. I think 75% uh, of it was actually in the backup structure, which was a big takeaway for us. Uh, just making sure everything was aligned. Uh, there were definitely some extra screw holes that we had in our system. And we decided to dry fit the planter first because uh, the alignment of the planter across the perforated module was really important to our design concept. What you can also see is the helping hands and the vertical rails going up. And then the panels themselves, we had to be gravity loaded. They're very heavy. And so we had two people to kind of carry them over and we had to start from the bottom and work our way up. And so it was kind of a back and forth exercise of making sure that everything lined up appropriately. Some of the, the lessons learned, you know, you always want to have extra tolerance in your system. So these had extra tolerance within the helping hands. And then we had extra tolerance within the horizontals, kind of setting them anywhere along the, the vertical rails. Where the system broke down a little bit was the tube itself. So we kind of next time we'll make sure that's a slotted connection so we could adjust the tube up and down, uh, which was kind of the main support for the planter at the jam condition. Some of the complexities of the planter and the, the manufacturing itself. So you can see some of the draft angles that were required to kind of keep the planter uh, be, from being able to pull out of the slip cast form. We had the triangular kind of pieces preventing it from collapsing in the drying process. And then you can see in the bottom left, the tube that the middle planter kind of slid on top of. And there was a concern about the planter actually kind of tipping. And so the planter geometry helped to alleviate that by putting the top planter on and uh, gravity loading and changing the center of gravity uh, for the system, which really helped. Here you can see some of the gymnastics that Boston Valley did in their facility in terms of really hollowing out the back of this panel to minimize the weight and carbon footprint. And some of the, the patina that you're getting in the peaks and valleys and what that looks like from different vantage points. This is our two typical modules and you can see the, the kind of rotation 180 degrees and what's happening. So the top right is kind of where the glaze is pulled and applied the most and, and running. And then the bottom left is where the glaze is pulled. And you're also seeing here that zipper joint that we talked about and some of the false joints that are coming so that when this is applied across the facade, you don't notice all the panels and it reads more continuous, similar to uh, our contextual brick character. I think another main takeaway for us was just how unique the glaze was and the variation that you're getting within the shadows and sculptural nature of the panels. And so as we were spinning the cart around and it was, catching shadows differently, it kind of looked extremely different. And we'd imagine a, a, almost like a chameleon effect across the facade. So ultimately, you know, we do higher ed buildings. And so we wanted to take that and, and see what it might look like. So we took one of our projects at Emanuel College to see what this panel and kit of parts might look like on a facade. So you're seeing the, the planter modules at the window jam. So someone would be able to open the window and access those. The perforated module is located all the ground floor to keep it kind of open and transparent. And then the, how the glaze might dialogue and interact with the scale of the historic context. That concludes our presentation. We just wanted to thank uh, everyone so much who participated in ACAW who's here today. And we learned so much and really look forward to what the future holds for this next project. Super. Uh, thank you guys for, uh, for that presentation. I had, there are a few questions in chat that are mostly technical questions, uh, but I do think there's 
some important questions around biophilia and, and just testing. I know this is uh, uh, was similar to the question previously. Uh, did you guys do any particular uh, or have any particular previous understanding of the kind of planters and, and the medium that may be used uh, for planting uh, um, for, these, uh, for, for this application? That's a great question. Boston Valley was a, was a great resource for us, actually. They, they mentioned uh, some coconut husk that would go inside the planter to try and keep it lightweight and help with the drainage. And then each of our planters are connected to help with the drainage holes. And I'll let Dan chime in here. He was kind of our planter expert. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say Olivia was, was mainly the one who was investigating the uh, types of plants and stuff. But our main concern was really just making Did we lose him? I think you might have cut out. Okay. I'll, I'll take out what he was saying. No, I think our we were trying to make mm -hmm. sure that the, the water would always flow. So in the inside the planters, we had some bolt holes and then we had some drainage holes um, that were kind of connecting all the pieces and terracing. We also located the planter in such a way that it's outboard of the system so that the water would kind of drain and flow across the facade. Well, super, uh, guys, this is, uh, a, 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 the glaze is absolutely beautiful and uh, it's lovely to sort of see it in the light in these different ways. And I can imagine, yes, I think it's a totally chameleon effect that you would get as it changes from uh, the different light of the day. So uh, thank you for being part of ACAL and we look forward to your, your uh, inclusion in the upcoming book. Thank you so much.